Hello and welcome to this episode of How Would You Run That? A Dungeons and Dragons podcast and ideas factory with me, Lucas Tomlinson. And me, Jake Hanna. In this podcast, we'll be discussing some aspect of Dungeons and Dragons. An encounter, location, trap, puzzle, NPC, PC, god, magic item, or really anything that can exist in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Importantly, we'll then be asking each other the question, how would you run that? At the end of each episode, one of us will reveal the topic for next week's episode to the other and ask, how would you run that? Giving us each a week to research, plan, and prepare how we would run said thing. This week's episode is on an abandoned abattoir. Jake, how would you run that? Pow, 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 pow. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we need some sort of like exciting <laughs> intro music. Wait, is our intro music not exciting enough for you? No, I, I like it, but we need some sort of like, you know, like this just in, like explosions. All right, that'll be a and season two. And then we like two. straight into the action. Yeah, series two upgrade. We'll like news ticker <laughs> the, the intro. No worries. Did we decide actually, is this, the, is this the last episode of the series or is it the next one? I think this one might be it. This one's it? Yeah. Gosh. Okay. So episode 16, well done for making it this far, everyone. There's only probably an hour to go from now. Yeah. Oh, then it's summer holidays time. Summer holidays, and we'll plan series two, and oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh. Fortunately, we've had so much feedback from our adoring listeners across the United Kingdom, United States, Sweden, and Brazil. But, <laughs> oh, and Canada. Let's not forget Canada. Um, Canada's like big on listens, yeah. It is, yeah. One one location, but they listen to everything <laughs> multiple times. <laughs> I've got well, a horrible suspicion. This, yeah, exactly. Or it's like a, a cafe that's just like got Spotify on shuffle and it's hooked into us accidentally just looping <laughs> our shit in, a, in like a coffee shop in none of us. Yep. But I hope that's not the, the case. shuffle algorithm just uh, <laughs> keep pinging it up and they're like, oh, fuck, what is this, Skip? Or anyone looking for that running podcast. Yeah, that's it. That's where the Running Cup podcast is based. If that's the case, fine. Keep listening. Pump up. I mean, we're not even monetized, so pump them numbers. It's literally just ego boost for us. But I really do hope that it's it's getting some some traction. People are enjoying it. And yeah. Oh, I've been sleeping terribly recently. Mm-hmm. The heat. Like, with the weather being a bit warmer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, just to remind everyone, this is, this is a British podcast. It, um, it has been warm this last week or two weeks. Therefore, we need to complain. Fortunately, British normal service has been resumed. It's been pissing it down the last couple of days. We're blaming the Spanish because the weather people called it a Spanish plume and the weather came from their direction, so it's a foreigner's fault. Perfect. Oh, really? It means it's raining, which means you can grumble about <laughs> that as well. So don't worry, everything's fine. It's like, what, 13 degrees outside, which is, ooh, might put a jumper on, weather, but still, it's still summer. Um, England played football last night, which means people got something to whinge about because they didn't beat Scotland. Um, that really sort of sets this podcast. They? What do you mean they? I mean we. they because I am I, I am not playing on the England team. This is a thing that I understand. Get behind your crew, but I'm not on the field, so I cannot take credit for their for their like successes, and I cannot take blame for their failings. We didn't do anything. I thought you were more taking the Scottish side. Oh, I mean, well, if there's an opportunity. <laughs> Sorry, I'll put us back on. Shall track. we? Yeah, back on track. An abandoned abattoir. What a wonderful prompt. It's nice and open. You can do with it what you want. Here's what I would mm. do. And I, I like that that rhymed. That was satisfying to my ears. Pray do tell. Okay, so you start these things with a few questions, don't you? Abandoned abattoir. Bam. My questions were, where is it? Who owned it? Why is it abandoned? What is there now for a party? How would you run that? Pam, 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 pam. Yeah, I mean, the last one pretty much is the, is the, is the kicker. For the show. It, it is really so you know how i approach these things you know my style i'll drop a little bit of backgroundy thoughts i'll drop my session idea it's actually more of an adventure i think it's like a three session thing at least okay because things get out of control and they spin away so question question the first where is it and i'm sure you have questions too drop them in i may or may not have answers we will spitball them as we go because that's what we like i'm gonna scrutinize your ideas and get more information out of you do it Question yes. Question number one, where is it? <laughs> Answer, anywhere. <laughs> Great start, I like it. <laughs> what I mean by this is that I don't think we need to tie it to a, a location at all. Thinking less in terms of putting it in the setting, thinking more in terms of how would you run it as a session. It could be dropped literally anywhere. It could be an abattoir 
that services a city that your party are currently in. It could be an abattoir that is attached to a farm out in the sticks for to drop in some interest while your party's on a travel. That's probably how I would personally want to do it, like a small mm. farmstead that maybe services a town, and that's how it fits in with my my session, my plan. Mostly because when you're in a city, there's stuff going on. It's not too hard to generate more hooks or for there to be a reason for interactions, whereas when you're on the road, I find D&D travel a pain, personally, because there's a... Well, that, that's a little harsh. It's a strong way of saying it, but I don't... I don't like just rolling random encounters on the encounter table. You're traveling X miles, so roll the survival check. Do you make it in time? Or point-to-point things. I like a narrative-driven event. So I'll, I'll do a couple of like roadside encounters to illustrate the fact you're going from A to B. But my interest is mostly in progressing the narrative, which usually means getting to the place where the stuff gets done. Mm-hmm. So for sure. me, this would be a cool roadside encounter. Not dissimilar to the roadside tavern of episode 2 fame, where it's a, it's, a, it's something you could insert anywhere. So that's where I'm at. Yeah. A- any questions? When you say anywhere... No, I don't. Um, <laughs> no, I was just like... When you were saying you could literally have it anywhere, I was just picturing it like up a mountain or in the middle of the underdark. <laughs> but I, I guess when you say anywhere, you mean anywhere near enough to a regular population of people. You're not just sticking it in the desert. Well, yeah, okay. The, fair point. The purpose of an abattoir I'm is, of course, pissy, to though. generate edible meat for people out of panels so it doesn't or make... is it well Ooh, let's find out yeah <laughs> that means that it's probably gonna have to be somewhere either on a trade route or servicing a town or servicing a place yeah or with some sort of travel-based connection so it doesn't sure. make sense like you say to it's up in the the misty mountains right at the peak where the mm. where it crests the, the the swirling cloud at the very top, you'll find mm. the abattoir of souls, which actually all of a sudden sounds really fucking cool. I should have done that. That does. I was just saying, like, even if it well, abattoir of souls sounds fucking cool, but imagine yeah. if it was just like a regular abattoir. Why is it up the mountain? Yeah, who what an interesting it there? thing to just stick nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> oh, would, would it really derail your idea if we stick it on a mountain? No. No, I can, okay, I can, I can squeeze that. Remind me when we get into the depths of it that we stuck it on a mountain and that was <laughs> Okay, okay, okay. Actually, no, that does work. Right. Cool, we're up a mountain. We've got an abattoir on the we're side of the cliff. We're now up a mountain, or it's, it's on like a, um, a, a violently rocky outcrop or something. So it's almost like it seems like it's been dragged up with the earth during some right. climactic event where the, a mountain range has generated itself. I'm thinking like... You know, um, when you get underground levels in video games and it's all like down in the, not the pits of hell, but like the undergroundy stuff, you always get like hexagonal uh, tiles of, of columns yeah. or something. So it's a bit like Giant's Causeway, Northern Ireland, but that sort of look, but yeah. all squished together in like a big cool. rocky elevation that's erupted from the earth at some point way in the past. That's the critical thing is that when this happened, it was a while ago. So when your party's discovering it, it is in this place. It has been in this place for some time. It has been abandoned for some time. It's not freshly abandoned in my setting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it is up a mountain now, but like, <clears throat> do the local populace know it's there? Like, is it a known place or is it like, oh, that's weird that this is here unexpectedly? <laughs> uh, yes, it is a known place. Where it was, or the, the original setting okay. for it, so I had the, like this, this down on the luck farmer was um, having a shit time with their, their herd. And this is the bit that got me hooked into the concept the most, and it just sort of spiraled out of silliness from here. But I just, I had a pun and I loved it, so I ran with it. Farmer wanted to Go. pray to some gods to try and get some help with their crops. This is long ass fucking time ago. So, but they weren't religiously gifted, so they went along to a, a sort of like a temple or a temple hub, and they, they asked the clerics there. I need some help, please. I don't know who to address, but this is my problem. Where should it go? So I've mm. almost like conjured this idea of a um, a pantheon help desk of gods. It's like yeah. I have this problem. I don't know who which god is best served to to suit to help me with this problem. So can you direct my call accordingly? Yeah, yeah. Like take a ticket and get in the nature and life uh, domain queue. Literally that. And so th- th- this is not canon, but I love it as a thought. It just really mm-hmm. tickled me. Anyway, due to a literal clerical error, the prayer was misinterpreted and it found its way to the desk of Baphomet, 
who, if you want to dig around in the <sighs> lore, is the basically the Minotaur god who resides on the six hundredth circle of the abyss. Yeah. Anyway, Baphomet immediately took this request and thought, "Fuck yeah, this person's got a problem with their cows. I'm a Minotaur man. I'm gonna beef up these cows." So he immediately bestows his blessing to his bovine <laughs> brethren. I can't. Sorry, just really quick. I can't believe how quickly you skimmed over clerical error. Sorry. Like, <laughs> oh. I mean that. That's... I mean it's great, but oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's 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 a he's a he's now a mountain cow um, herder. Well, not intentionally. So what's happened in in his timeline at that point is the herd grows strong and healthy, magical. Like the, cool. the, the the blessing has worked. The farmer didn't know where it went. He's just gone to the clerics and said, "This is my problem. Yep. Direct it appropriately." Thanks for your help. Baphomet sorted him out. Baphomet's gone, fuck yeah, I'm going to make your cows hench. Baphomet like an arch devil. Yep. Yep. Fuck it hell, that's going to backfire. <laughs> and it does. <laughs> cool. That cleric, how did he get, how did he get, like, the regular... Pa- <laughs> how? <laughs> like, Jesus, what a cock-up. <laughs> maybe that's the part we have to dive into, or maybe that's the... This is going to be the sort of thing that's, like, lore dump, so the farmer is gone, like, in, in the timeline when the party turn up. Sure. This, this is way, way in the past, so there'll but be But this new breed of cows has endured, are we saying? To some degree. The, the reason that this abattoir exists and is abandoned, at the very least, is herd grew strong and healthy, farmer prospered, became very wealthy, seed in some things that maybe the children didn't need to become herders, and so there was no, like, desire to continue the family business, but they had all this wealth and all this stuff. The, okay. the the mechanic at plays with each successive slaughter, it felt like it was more and more difficult. And that's because with every generation or every time it came around, for every bit of like blessed blood spilt, the cows grew stronger and more muscular, tougher. So, right, and just like a general darkness starts to swirl around this abattoir. So before it would be a case of they go into town, they take their meats, they do their things, and people would go to them. I want to purchase some meat. So I'm a butcher, or I like meat. And they would do mm-hmm. that. The longer and longer this goes on, it starts to fall apart a little bit. So yeah, they, they've got this meat and this produce and they're able to sell it across the world. But the locals shy away from it. No one goes to their door to buy it anymore because it's creepy, it's weird. The methods of um, butchery become a little bit more barbaric and unpleasant. Dressed up in the in the farmer's minds, like this is harder to do. I, I'm really having to push. I'm really having to like saw these things apart. But actually he's getting crueler and more mm. unpleasant. You can sort of see where this might be going. Baphomet has cursed this place. And for every bit of this blood spilt, long story short, time moves on. The ground erupts and spews itself out as a portal to the abyss pops into existence at the center point. Wonderful. I mean, fuck it out. (laughs) It really really has elevated. Now, this isn't going to be a portal where stuff is constantly spewing out all the time. It's just... It's almost like a, a footnote in Baphomet's life. He's like, oh yeah, I signed that ticket ages ago. It's like an autograph for a fan. It's happened, it's gone. This isn't like his main plan. He's doing his own shit in the abyss. And yeah, doing I mean, he, he sort does. of like started that project and handed it off to someone else to manage. Exactly. So what is, what's really gone on is it's more just a fact that because all this this blessed, cursed, whatever, blood is being spilt the, in the same location, because it's the, it's the slaughter point. Yeah, drip, mm. drip, 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 drip. Curse, 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 curse. Event. And it's not even on Baphomet's radar necessarily. It's just there is now a portal to the abyss here. So that allows you to tailor what is in the abattoir to the level of your party. It could be something as simple as a couple of imps have found it and they've popped their way through and now they're causing a couple of issues. Or it could be Mm -hmm. something much more deadly. You could have incubi, succubi in the area doing some weird shit. If you've got a bitch-ass party, you could chuck a pit fiend in there, CR20, Mother Hubbard and give them something to really fight. Okay, that sort of, that so... sort of leads on, sort of on on what's in there now for a party. The why did they abandon? I think that sort of speaks for itself. The farmer died. The abattoir is up at the top of a big old mountain thing. Nobody local wanted to go there anymore. So really just this source of wonderful meat has dried up you know, hundreds of years in the past. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. So basically like this area and then there's like a cursed area. You've got this abattoir on the Newly erupted. I guess newly erupted. How long ago did the farmer events happen? And it's what's gonna be the scene looking like now? A few lifetimes. 
but not okay. not millennia. So I'm saying, let's say a couple of hundred years. So like long lived races might be aware of the bloke who was once there. Maybe a dwarf in the nearest town is still familiar. Oh yes, I remember the delicacies of delicacies of yore when we would eat the special beef of the whatever abattoir. Mm-hmm. What's the, we need to name the abattoir? I think then. What's the what's the we farmer's do. family name? I don't mind. Let's. Then we can call the abattoir that. We can call the beef that. You know, it's. Uh... Yeah, you're right. It does need a name. I had another pun for um... this, but it's fallen out of my head. It's Taz. The surname is Taz because it's then it's Taz and Beefy, which locks it in Taz my and mind. Beefy. <laughs> Fantastic. And for anyone that doesn't get that reference, because I don't think many people will, uh, just go <laughs> you're not all on the Taz internet. And beefy. In 2007. <laughs> yeah, this is. You know, I say this. So you showed me when you know I was still at school. Taz yeah. and Beefy ridiculous video um of some yeah very drunk junior mc types at a rap batizzle oh, yep it's Great premium video. premium youtube content definitely go out there cool so it's taz so farmer taz farmer taz taz's meats taz's okay, beefy yeah. cuts taz's beefy cuts wow <laughs> yeah that really dials it. into cool. the, the edm scene at the time <laughs> mm, cool so old farmer taz yeah. Okay, and so the the abattoir itself is a bit out of town or away from that nearest town, and nobody goes there anymore. They smell. I mean, there is in or there was one in Retford. You may or may not recall on the other side of the river, now sort of where Morrison's is, and yeah, on certain days of the week, bloody stank. Like they're not yep. pleasant environments. So yeah, it's outside of town. The, the 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 town that it is near. If you're going to put it near one, I'd suggest make it a big enough town that they are able to have that sort of facility away so probably not a a teeny tiny frontier farmstead because that would have the abattoir in it it would be the source of income and some other stuff but yeah probably something like a the sort of town that might have mm-hmm. city uh, walls city walls that sort of size you might be able to say oh this is outside of town or cool you know, do yep. you want whatever for me it's out of town do farmer taz's descendants still live in the town or nearby well farmer taz probably had a couple of kids Due to the wealth in the family, they didn't need to continue the family trade. And I would say that they were, they traveled. Mm-hmm. So they went to larger cities to find an education and better themselves. Okay. But they will still exist in the world. And that could be a fun cool. tie in later on. Maybe they are being chased down, or you, know, you, you could link them in with the curse might not be for the place, but for the people or something. So that, that could be something that comes back okay. if you really wanted. Certainly not part of my setting right now. Cool. But a cool little linger. If That's like. fine. I just wondered, like, how how set this place still is. But it's like it's abandoned. It's out of town. No one really thinks about it. It's thought of cursed. People might know about what happened if they've long lived enough. But yeah, generally, it's just like, don't worry about it. Yeah, cool. I've got some thoughts about what's inside the abattoir to a small degree. Basically, there's a couple of little things that I really want to sort of log in our minds before we start exploring and and spinning it out. Where I wanted to go with this, before I'd even sort of landed on Baphomet getting involved, I wanted the idea of a three-stage adventure. So info-gathering, exploration, resolution. (laughs) Info-gathering is you find out about the abattoir, there's a hook, there's somebody that wants something out of it or something resolved. I don't have a good one of those yet. Inside the abattoir, I wanted to make it a bit mindfucky. So I like this idea of... Um, like a sliding maze or a rotating maze or something. So the route through the abattoir isn't clear. And every okay. time you're, if your party stick together, for example, as they move through the maze, if they go around a corner and they can no longer see bottom right corner of the map, it'll rotate and then they come back and it's it's constantly shifting. So they've, they've got to figure out why the walls keep moving and how to manipulate that to their benefit. Okay. That really fucking ties in with Baphomet because he's a fucking minotaur. It's a labyrinth. I was, it's like, oh my god! Once I started pulling these bits together, I, was like, I really yeah. like this idea. So I'm, I'm doubling down in that. I was just looking at um, Mordenkind and Tuna Foes and reading the page on Baphomet, and like it's one of his <laughs> lair actions is to seal a doorway or it's the entrance within the lair. So like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's going to like dial into the fact that Baphomet isn't here. He's not aware of this no. place. It's not. It's not his plan it's not his current active project but it is inextricably linked to his power so Mm -hmm. it's almost like just the chaotic nature of this place every time you turn around the walls move like the um, like the weeping angels in doctor who or 
that sort of thing. Maybe maybe not something that's like directly antagonistic, but if the party are all mm-hmm. facing north and then they turn east and then north again, it doesn't look the same necessarily. Or okay. Like, and I'd do this online in like Roll20 by having like a four section maze or like eight section maze where I can rotate all the pieces. So there'd be like multiple solutions for the maze. Mm-hmm. But maybe they have to go to a place and press a lever that locks something in place. Or maybe just because it's meant to be chaotic, they just have to split the party and think, right, I'm going to keep looking at that wall. You go over there and rotate some other shit and you know, we'll, we'll meet up. Yeah. I guess for audio listeners, this isn't, it's, it's difficult to visualize it. I'd be really interested to see how that would look on an actual map. Yeah. Like basically, you'd have... What would the mechanic be? Would it be that... Would you break up the map into a grid? And mm. basically, if you move three tiles through that grid, uh, or three sections through that grid, that you, you then get the option to change something behind them? Or, or how, would you, how, would you really, well, how would you work that? I would probably run it in initiative order. Just to stop multiple players running around doing their thing at the same time and allow me mm. in-game moments to do this. And I'll probably treat it as a layer action. So either on Initiative 20, something will shift, mm-hmm. which is probably the easier way to do it because then that kind of times the event. Like I can decide as DM when the maze resolves itself. Yeah. Um, which is probably the sensible way to do it. The other way you could do it is you could do it based on party presence. So a a tile will not shift if there are conscious observers in it. It gets a bit quantum at that point. But Mm -hmm. any other one could. So if you split the party, you think, like, this feels like it's the right answer. This feels like it's the right answer. We're going to, like, split the party and stay in these two places and let the other ones rotate at a certain time. That could be quite cool if there is a, a time element or a danger element. So maybe you've got, like, wandering monsters that will... They're also patrolling the maze. Yeah, I've just thought maybe maybe you have the solution be that they have to split the party because obviously mm-hmm. that's you know the number one way to get TPK to split the party, so they'd be hesitant. But yes. if they all move on initiative order and you've got a layer action on initiative twenty or something, you could say that the initiative you know that the layer action is I close if there's five members of the party I close mm-hmm. four doors or four routes get sealed. Yeah. So the only way, you know, basically you're you're blocking them at every turn, and the only way they can get over those four ceiling doors is to take five different routes. Hmm. That could I, be cool. I could see something like that working, maybe. That's a harder maze to draw, but it's a it's a cool way of doing it. Yeah, I'm thinking then probably you wouldn't use like a background image. Well, you maybe have a background image with um. You remember? Did you ever play square? Of course, you did. Everyone played squares when you were when you were younger. When you got like, yeah. a grid of dots and you have to draw things, right? I'm imagining something like that with like lots of pins in it. Mm. And then you would basically just use the draw function, roll twenty, just to seal off like uh, ways through that area. Yeah, and you know it would have to be like mostly populated, like a regular maze to start with. Yes, that's but, a good um, way to do it. One, yeah, so if you imagine you, you draw out like a regular standard maze that has one route from start to finish, mm. um, but because it's all squares, you can you can basically add five temporary doors per turn. Yeah, so the party all moves. You put the, the blockers in, and then they move again. And you have to take off the blockers you put in and draw new ones. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah, that could you work. know, yeah. I mean, if they walk the perfect path to start with, which I guess because well, you have to do it dynamic lighting because if you've got a top-down view of a maze, you're going to figure it out. Exactly. But, yeah, that's yeah. kind of where I was at. I liked the, the other way I was trying to think of it, and that this isn't like resolved or completely planned through. Is when I said I've got like four corners of a map. If you had such a... And I'm sure these things exist. I went to Google and I turned up a couple of results. There are some board games that are kind of like this, but nothing that does exactly what I want. Mm. But just like rotating segments. So for simplicity's sake, four corners, four quadrants, and they form a a path from bottom left to top right. Why not? But then if you rotate the top right quadrant, all of a sudden it doesn't solve itself. It actually loops back into the bottom right. Yeah. And it... That wouldn't yeah. work with dynamic lighting. That's a royal pain in the ass because you can't no. dynamically move your lighting lines. Dynamic lighting on online would be a really cool, cool way of doing this mm. visually. Get like everyone if you in, could in fix it to a tile, say. Yeah. Mm. So your version of the blockers really does work for for doing that. And if if you are using Roll Twenty and you've got the the pro thing, you can have like the the version of dynamic lighting that lets explored areas persist but grayed out. Which is okay, cool, because yeah. then you're not losing your progress. Like, okay, we walk that way, we know that bit, but then you could bang in a new line and mm. 
show and hide bits as you like. I really like this idea of a moving map. I'm going to have to figure out something to stick my... I'm going to have to like ham fist it into my campaign somehow now. Yeah, I, I really want to do this now that it's, it's been thought of. Yeah. I didn't. I did. I don't know if I mentioned before, but we've 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 done our first session back in person recently. Ah, no. Um, so we're back. We're we're off roll twenty. We're back on the um, the the plastic sheets with the dry wipe eraser. Nice. Like drawn all over it. So like that would work really well with like just drawn on. Like they they mm. do all their moves and then I just lean over and like nope 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 like draw the lines <laughs> in front of the characters. It's oh, like funny. very unbalanced noughts and crosses. Yeah. You, just, you can't win as the cross, but you can constantly block the noughts. <laughs> yeah. But again, like even with yours, I th- I feel like if they split up and cover more ground, they're more likely, they, they increase their chances of getting to the exit, even with the rotating pieces, mm. because they're going to be affected differently by the rotation, so there's more likely that the, the route to the end is going to be possible. Yeah. I do like the idea of putting monsters in as well. Yeah, I think there should be something, and I'd, I'd tailor it to party level. So, firstly, this is a maze, and I'm trying to make it difficult. So I'm going to fill it full of clues, right? And I mean lots mm-hmm. of different types of clues, things that are obvious. St- nothing that requires necessarily an investigation check to discover, but maybe a little bit of thought to understand. So other adventurers have come this okay. way before. No one's ever come back. Maybe that's one of the hooks from the village. There's going to be, like, scrawlings from people who've gone mad, lost in the maze forever. There's going to be corpses with like partial drawn maps in their clutch in their hands and just this idea of Mm. plenty of options to try and because it might not be immediately clear what's going on in this maze and why it's so insolvable and the absolute worst thing for a party is for them to walk around not knowing what they're doing yes and as a dm you're like there are clues i feel like if i just tell you it kills it you can figure this out, but you haven't, and you know exactly how it is when you get stuck in that rut of like, well, I, I've seen everything. What more could there be? Mm-hmm. You know, I've got a, a sort of a sort of solution for that, and it's mm. a bit dependent on your party. But um, passive intelligence, do you ever use it? No, but only because I feel like when I have to resort to it, it's it's the afterthought. Yeah. So my my thinking is like, you know, if a, if a party's stuck on something, they've really exhausted everything. I will, you know, and like I'm, I'm saying, like you know, time's gone on, and 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 you know, in, in game as well, like the character tried a few things and nothing's really worked, nothing's really yeah. clicked. I'll I'll go for their passive intelligence. Who's got, I'll, you know, throw it out there. Who's got the highest passive intelligence? Hmm. You know, it's this or that character. Okay, you know, having seen how things are playing out, you get in the idea of that, and then give them some vague, like sort of hint in the right direction. Yeah, and I I found that goes down quite well. Because it's it's not just giving them it, it's not telling them the answer, but it helps them to find the answer themselves based on your guy's pretty smart. So yeah, they they you know they have an inkling. Yeah, and that's usually enough to sort of tease them in the way direction you want to go. Well, we kind of had to resort to that just this week, didn't we? With the um, the organ puzzle. Yeah, where it wasn't clear, and, yeah. and I thought it was like th- there are plenty of clues in here, but the the one like the the biggest hint I could think of was immediately misinterpreted and was like, I have to let you run with this for a while. Yeah. But eventually it's like, please someone try and do something with this. So I'm not just saying, nudge, nudge, this is the hint. And eventually yeah. the wizard character who was locked in the area with the clue what, wanted to try and figure out how they could play the, the organ. But instead it's like, okay, well with that and with your thoughts and with the other stuff, you make the connection between that and the clue on the wall. Hmm. But then I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, the players all knowing that they've had a little bit of help to get around something mm. and then the story or the you know whatever's happening in the game can still progress because i mean if if <laughs> without it i mean how hard are you going to play into it the part yeah your party stays here until food and water is exhausted and you die you know like <laughs> do you just fast forward to however many weeks time um, and that was the end of the bin boys yeah <laughs> no i can't see it first that's the main reason that I want to make sure there's enough stuff in this maze that it's it's the story should tell itself if you don't discover it in this mm-hmm. case. So there needs to be allusions to the fact that this wall wasn't here when I first came here or a map with loads of stuff crossed out. I was like, what the hell's going on here? Why is this moved? Or someone that's yep. like leaving breadcrumbs or like drawing along the wall to trace their route and then there's a gap in the tracing, but then it picks up again on the other side of a gap. And well, how has that happened? Yep. Did they come round or 
that was the sort of thing I was thinking. So so it's an abattoir, right? So yep. there's blood smatters everywhere. Yeah. Right. And you could you could easily have that like a smear on like like you said with a gap where a wall sized bit would be all the way around. It goes up to a wall and seems to run like directly behind it. It doesn't stop, but there's nothing on the on the the wall that's blocking you. Then. Yeah. You know you could do all sorts of things like that. And what I was thinking is, you know, it's an abattoir, so fine. There's animal blood. You would expect that. But mm-hmm. if anyone does a survival check and or an investigation or whatever and looks closely enough, it's like that's not all. Uh, that's not all cow blood. <laughs> <laughs> that's certainly some other kind of blood. Um, be it demon or and um, gelatinous. Oh, oh, that's gross. I was thinking yeah. just like you know, it was a slightly darker hue or something. <laughs> you know what this place needs? This place needs. Um... This could be the Black Pudding Roomba test centre where you, um, <laughs> you you prove their intelligence by can they solve the maze and also clean them up completely. And only the smartest Black Puddings get released into like the medical sector. Very funny. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> so so we're, good, we're good on clues. We're good on the rough mechanics of the, of the, yeah. the lair. Um, what kind of monsters we're going to find are we just finding straight up demons from the abyss purely party level specific to anyone that wants to run this sort of thing what i would like to do is maybe have a couple of things in the area so there'd be like the the intro portion the maze portion and then the resolution section will be in a separate area like the actual slaughterhouse center where you know where the literally where the sausage gets made yeah um so during the maze portion you could have wandering monsters if you wanted to introduce another level of um, peril. There we go. There's my buzzword for the session. Mm. And I'm thinking it could be something as low level as imps or maybe nothing that would fly because that would kind of ruin the session. Or this needs to have some sort of lid on it to um, to negate any flying characters naming no names. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so we're having we're having uh, level specific, but there's, there's, you've got no, you know, you've not thought of like um, a minor, as like a, a homebrewed minotaur demon or something in the labyrinth. I hadn't I hadn't actually planned to put necessarily anything in the labyrinth. I would possibly dot some stuff in as a random encounter roll. Okay. So every time you enter a new, if if you're doing like the section of the map thing, it would be a okay. As you enter this section, is there a monster here? Yes, no. In which case, I wouldn't make it the hardest thing in the world to fight. I don't think there should be, like, the boss of the labyrinth. Although, good thought from you there, if your players are fully, fully struggling to solve the the maze because it keeps shifting and they're not figuring it out, you could put in a fight. And when you defeat the foe, the maze sort of returns to its original shape and then it is just a walk through the maze. You're always talking about yeah. having like a brute force approach or a way so you're not just like limiting your characters or limiting your players' ability to progress through one method only. Mm-hmm. Multiple ways to skin the cat in an abattoir that's appropriate. <laughs> Actually, here's another point for yes, an idea very that good. I'd sort of <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Something I put at the end. Um, this is based on um, a post on Reddit about one shots the other day. And they said it's cool mm. or try giving your party the loot at the start of the session. And you think, interesting. The, the the core thought being, if it's purely a one-shot, then you do the thing, you do the activity, you beat the boss, you get the loot, you never see the loot again because it's a one-shot and it's not like a persistent bit of the narrative. You think, oh, shit. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, there are other ways of doing it. You could do like backstory one-shots and that's how your character got their custom sword or their, their legendary item or whatever it is that they started the campaign with. This isn't about that. What you could do is for the for the abattoir, or the, the approach they were taking was saying, give them the item that lets them win the one shot. So in the case of this abattoir, maybe the person who gives you the quest to go and explore it says, the, these were my father's tools and they became exceptionally strong over time. And maybe they are like a cursed item that has a particular boon in the abattoir. Maybe they have like a plus million to hit or they do a certain type of damage, or it's the only key to unlock a certain door. Anyway, make them like OP in the abattoir. Once you've finished the adventure, they get to keep the item, but the curse is cleansed. So it's still a cool item, but it maybe is nerfed back down to like yeah. a balanced state. But while they're in the abattoir doing the session, it will have some, well, yes, yeah, so some overpoweredness, some not game-breaking okay. feature, but 
if you land the killing blow with this, or if if you if you make a hit against a creature with this particular weapon, or this this armor is impervious to their type of damage, or they will be, you you will be able to mind control one person while wearing the the blood stained apron of the abattoir, or something bizarre like that. So mm-hmm. you've got some massive boon. It's a real reason to go in and do the adventure, and then you get the cleanse version on the way out. And I thought that could be quite cool. And you could do the same sort of thing in the labyrinth as well. Maybe the item that you have is a, a wayfinder, and if, if you spend so long in the maze, it will start showing you the path, or it will glow when you point the right way. Or yep, I understand. Sounds good. Something. It's another kind of clue, but I just wanted to get that idea about give them the loot at the start of the session, or the start of the adventure could be quite a cool way. So it would be entirely useless outside. If they took the loot, so thank you very much, we're not going to do your adventure, fine. Now you have a cursed item, live with consequences. But if, okay. you, if you go and do the job with the cursed item, then you get the cleansed version afterwards. So now we're getting into the why of the party going to the abattoir. So yeah. have they met Mr. Dwarf, um, who's the only one that remembers how it was, and he has... What items will we have? Will we have like some impeccable cleaver or uh, some kind of dagger? Um, You know, something that... um... It's got to be abattoir flavoured. That's a horrible thing Mm. to say, but it's got to be the the tools of the trade. So I'm thinking like um, a leather apron. I'm thinking a... That doesn't replace your armour, but could go on top. So it's like an accessory or cleavers or blades. What about like a meat hook that's like a buff to a melee weapon? So you can imagine like a monk holding this meat hook with it coming through the hands or like a rogue yeah. using that as a as a weapon um sure so it's like a boon to your unarmed strikes or something yeah something like that um so you have to forego your weapons but if you use that you get the opportunity to i don't know you you hit a creature with the meat hook and they have to make a wisdom save and if they fail they become temporarily your ally for a turn or something like that oh god yeah because you've got your you you've, you've, you've got my claws got, into you that's what i'm thinking i'm trying to think how to make it hooked based like you know you've yeah. hooked them um yeah, that would be. You could definitely have things like that. What, what, what are you thinking for the for the apron? Say, like, what, what? Could well, that I wasn't be? sure. Maybe, maybe it would be just resistant to to fiends, or okay, it's like a damage resistance, like a damage resistance, or maybe they wouldn't target you as a foe because you're the person who runs this place. Um, mm. So they would just okay. see you as a some sort of moniker of of um, kind of like a. Yeah, not not like a charm person, but kind of like a charm person thing, but like a one person, like an inverted charm person. So any fiend in combat doesn't see you as a foe unless you directly aggravate them. So as long as you don't attack them, they won't attack you. Yeah. So it's okay, like a life preserver. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it I would like give that. you benefits in um, conversation, perhaps. Conversation with a fiend. Well, you never know. You might get to the end, and there was a. Um, this is just literally just ripping an idea from the internet. It's not one that I wanted to put in, but um, mm. like a maybe there's a heavily pregnant vampire giving birth in the final room or something. <laughs> if they like, they are not going to want to fight as a first option. They're going to want to talk, but they are um, something that you would normally fight. Or maybe there is a a, a a demon fiendy mother with a brood of hatchlings or something. You think right? Well, obviously we want to dispel you or get rid of you or send you back where you came from, but maybe walking in and Anakin Skywalkering the younglings isn't the route we want to take as a mm. party. So... Sure. Okay. I'm, cool. I'm not saying that conversation's like plan A, but it should never be off the table. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so that's fine. So we've got the dwarf guy. He's got some sort of item that he believes if you return to the abattoir and do something, the item will be uh, made clean. So yeah. why why is he now looking for adventurers to take this burden from him? I think he wants the portal closed. I think maybe it's been a something of nothing for a long old time. Maybe some imps discovered it and just been using it to play tricks in the material plane. Mm-hmm. But word has got out on the 600th level of the abyss. Is it 600th? I wrote it down. It's, either, it's not 666. That's too obvious. <laughs> Yeah, it's 600th layer of the abyss. Maybe words got out a little bit, or a, a larger, more difficult creature has spotted the portal, and they've sort of made their way through, and okay, you could be as overt as attacks were made on the town, or it could be as simple as the abattoir that we used to get the cool meat from was up at the top of that hill. I sent my son up there to go and see if there's anything left of the old the old place and he never returned so i sent some more people sure. and they never returned it's like oh shit something must be happening there go and yeah that's a big deal finding nemo my son please yep 
God, yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's that's enough of a reason why you'd, you'd want uh, adventurers to go. I guess he's looking for them generally and then, um, you know, he has the meat hook or the apron yeah. or something. He's like, you know, like this is your, like this might help you. Um, <laughs> it's dangerous outside. Um, <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't want okay. to be so grimdark as like his son has gone in there and dies because well, of his father's desire for one last stake. That feels like unnecessarily grim. But Well, let's go like... for the, the first option you said then. So, like, yeah, it's not been a big deal. There's been a few, like, smaller things, but no one's really paid any need. He's the only one that's old enough in the area to remember um, the slaughterhouse in its prime. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he thinks now it's time to do something. There was some attack for something that would be trivial to the party, but, you know, dangerous for commoners. Yeah. And uh, everyone else thinks it's a one-off, they're not bothered, but he suspects it's from the from the abattoir. If you wanted to make it a little bit... Uh, longer form as an adventure you could have some stuff going on in the town as well I'm thinking if you go to the sort of the more charming demonic-y fiendy things your incubi and succubi and similar they could be now in the material plane charming locals getting them to do weird things just generally causing problems because that mm-hmm. is, that's their nature they, they will they'll turn up they will imitate or they will yeah. project to the image of themselves as something attractive to the target and they will I charm get them. confused between devils and demons <laughs> Demons are from the abyss, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes, yeah. And they're the gross ones. Yeah. yeah. Devils are from the nine hells, and they are. Like, <laughs> I don't think it matters for most players, unless you're doing like a real, you know, adventure into the abyss or something. Yeah, I think I'm more just dialed into the fiend being the the type. If for no other reason, paladins usually have some stuff to use against fiends, and it's a nice opportunity to let those sorts of abilities shine. Because you know, paladins never mm. really get to do anything cool anyway. We're going to about pa- paladins like the versatile <laughs> class. Yep. But it's so often it's like, I, I want to use detect good and evil. It's like, okay, the entire abattoir is basically on fire. It's like when Neo sees the, the city <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the Matrix. It's like, that, that, is, that is the evil place. Did you watch uh, Daredevil on Netflix? No, I never finished it. Uh, okay, there's a, there's a few scenes in that where you see how Daredevil sees the world and it's basically everything's on fire around him. Oh, right, shit. <laughs> yeah. Picturing that as well. Um, okay, cool. So, yeah, that's that's the, the start of the adventure. Dwarf guy's like, hey, things are going down. I think it's the abattoir yeah. uh, because of reasons. Here, take this magical item with you. If you know, I think if you can get to the bottom of it, whatever curse it is that's on it, will be lifted and you'll we'll have a cool thing. Yeah. They go there. They get into the maze. The maze is difficult, and we'll talk about the counts for that. You said, though, also, it's a three-stage adventure. What happens after the first stage, the first stage being the maze? Well, the first stage was, like, quest hook and info gathering. So if you want to make it longer, oh, that's where you have the stuff happening in town with attacks or charmings or mm-hmm. whatever you want to do, whatever has come out of the abyss to do something fun. Something to tip you off. Something to tip you off. Like, you're in this town... Because maybe maybe the hook is not strong enough. Maybe you're walking along the nice, safe road bandit free from town a to town b town b a lot of shit goes on in town b when we talk about it and yeah you're describing the walk and off to the side you see this almost unnatural almost out of place mountainous eruption um hundreds of years old moss covered and what have you and at the top just in the swirling mists you see the outline of a building it's almost like scooby-doo castle level of description Mm -hmm. on top of the winding hills or something and your party go Cool, that sounds interesting. Anyway, on to town B. You're like, you're, you're going, going in that abattoir. abattoir. <laughs> yes. You go to it, town B and it's like, I don't know, some horrible abominations like attacking someone. It could be that simple. It could be, yeah, you walk in and shit is literally going down. You get involved in the fight and see who wins. and Yeah. Or they get ambushed on the road to town B by something like yeah. that. You know. I would prefer to try and get a party to discover rather than force them in. Personal preference. I would like there to be something intriguing and then the party, because they're usually played by my friends, would say, ah, you've created some intrigue here. Let us explore the intrigue. Okay, so rather than getting attacked by something, on the way to Town B, Hmm. they come across some dead wildlife that's been mauled and bloody, but, you know, on close inspection... It's not been eaten. It's just been killed for some reason. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so it's like there's something something grim on the rude. Grim on the rude. On the rude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that could absolutely work. You've got a billion different ways to do it. Let's say for our setting, just so we've locked something down, it is that. There are just off the beaten track, maybe when you're making camp, so it's not like directly on the road. Or maybe the closer you get to the town, it is really overt. It is right in the middle of the road. There is a small pile of deer carcasses and they've all been killed in similarly grotesque manners. They've, they've had something torn or maybe a throat's torn out or something minging, but they're not being there for for food. And yeah, you know, survival check. They've been there for two days and wolves haven't come and carrion birds haven't come to try and eat them. Why? That's interesting. Everything's scared. It's super cursy. All that sort yep. of thing. So that, that, that tips you off that there's something fighting going on. So let, let's ditch the Incubus Succubus thought for now. That's another way you could get something going on. You could have them try and charm party, charm people in town, whatever. For our session, there is something on the road. You can't miss it. If you don't investigate it, I hate you. <laughs> we just we walk around the deer carcasses and continue <laughs> to town B. Yes. Where for reasons you'll get it after the dwarf. But yeah, that is that session section one, info gathering. Yep. Hook. <laughs> Lol. Um, quest giver gives you a line, and <laughs> we're giving the party the item at the start as well. So exactly, yeah. yeah. Box checked. Section two is getting up to the place, or maybe section one is getting up to the place as well. Anyway, section two is the maze itself. Now, I wasn't going to make the journey up the mountain because it didn't exist until half an hour ago. That's not going to be <laughs> necessarily super perilous, but maybe it is. Maybe we'll we'll explore that as part of our proper session craft, but session two is the maze. Mm-hmm. Cause I would, I would expect that to take a whole session to get out and the, either the items that they've been given will help guide them through the numerous clues left by past adventurers will get them through. Maybe there'd be a couple of imps flying around that you, that you fight and in their dying breaths, they give you information or who knows you figure out mm-hmm. the maze one way or another. Sure. The final section would be you get out of the maze and you're entered into like the main abattoir hall. It's going to be super, super bloodstained. It's going to be like a, a portal to the abyss, just chilling in the middle, sort of maybe small-ish, but pulsing or growing or something. And ultimately, you need to close that portal. That is the goal of your party. Okay. How do we close the portal? Honestly, any appropriately themed way. So I would allow someone casting Dispel Magic with a Strong Arcana check. I would allow a good character to smite it. You know, a paladin could go and say, I want to punch the portal with my divine energies. And it's like, okay, let's expend some <laughs> slots. And do so. basically, as we've said before, DM's job is to sap your party's resources. So as long as they come up with an idea that would suitably you think is okay, that is equivalent, I would pretty much let it slide. I don't want it to be a difficult resolution because the maze would probably be in, have been quite difficult. Okay, so just as a just as sort of a catch-all then, yep. say the party are entirely stumped and wouldn't think that something like Dispel Magic would be strong enough to, you know, to stop it. Yep. Do you have a, a fallback something to help yeah. them close the ball? I was thinking they could have some sort of, um, what, Two, two things. One, you could fight something, and when it dies, the portal goes with it. Because Perfect. fights are easy. Also, now that we've given them all the loot at the start, I think when they're in this room, all of the loot would be glowing. And if yeah, that, that should be enough of a draw to say, oh, hang on, this shit wasn't glowing before. Or uh, you feel a strange pull towards the portal with the, the meat hook in your hand, and you think, okay, and if they, if they offer up the items to the portal, it will suck itself closed. Okay, so losing the item then at the end of the story. Yeah. But that would be a shame, but it would be a route. If someone's like, okay, if they're agonizing over, it's like, what if I put my item into the portal? Would that close it? You can try. And yes, it would. Sure. Like the meat hook's like a key. You put it in, turn it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pull it out. Yeah. That'd be cool. Literally. And then you might still okay. keep the, the apron or something, but I don't yeah. know what boon it would bestow upon you. Yeah, a regular plus one or something to your EC. I don't know. Who cares? Yeah. Gives you okay. advantage in all conversations with butchers <laughs> is it just like, just with the apron is it all blood smattered and disgusting yeah like do you look like a real butcher yeah it's going to be I'm, I'm thinking the kind of items i would describe would be out of um like dark souls or bloodborne particularly yeah okay that level of like lovecraftian grimdark minging stuff so if you're wearing this and just walk into a regular tap and everyone's sort of like what the fuck it's covered in blood you yeah <laughs> you probably like have n- negative 
boons on your um, what more buff, uh, debuffs on your charisma mm-hmm. checks, but it would probably afford you. It'd have to give you something to take something away. Or well, give you probably advantage on the intimidation. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. Okay, yeah, your persuasion goes down, but your intimidation goes up. Cool. So we've got the we've got the portal room now, the main slaughter mm. room. I'm guessing this is like uh, there are chains and there are meat hooks and uh, yes, you know there are there are sort of like benches and lots of sort of areas where the blood can drain away. I mean, I'm thinking more of a modern abattoir maybe than, but I don't know what they would have been in the past. I guess you didn't have industrial slaughterhouses. In the same no, way. so I've kind of gone between cattle shed and slaughterhouse that I can think of. So mostly of wooden construction. Okay, is it all tiled? Um, no, it's all wooden floor. Um, just with like a, a drain floor. area in the middle. Maybe maybe there's like a stone stone floor section, like a little stone circle, which is like where the, mm-hmm. the deed is done. Some chopping blocks. I think there should be some nod to the fact that everything has got yeah. a little bit more cruel and twisted. So. Maybe as the cows were harder to slaughter, there are like guillotines that have been brought in, or not not torture machines per se, oh, right. but stuff like stuff that's the mental like mechanisms that are helping the the farmer gain mechanical advantage over these like beefy ass cows. Are there like cow skeletons just like laying around as well? Oh, for, for sure. Yeah, there's there's piles. There's there's just Bones general ming, general oh. ming. Cool. Because um, <laughs> like if because I'm just thinking. Like to, to sort of clue in the fact that the cows became more and more perverted through each generation. Maybe there are like cow car like not carcasses, but they rotted away with cow skeletons. But yeah, you know, you can see that there are like horns growing in places they shouldn't do and stuff. Yeah, but yeah. The bones themselves are warped, you know, to show that these were some mean fucking cows. Yeah. Now this is also cool. the perfect area for a fight. So if your party is sufficiently leveled, this is where the fight will happen. And it could be maybe something is guarding the portal, something has come through. And if you have a very low level thing, maybe it would just be you know, low level fiends. Basically, something appropriately um, leveled to your party and a couple of them. Okay, so we're not thinking like there's one big bad thing. It's going to be like there's a group of regular demons appropriate for your level, whatever they are. I would like it for, for my game. I'd like it to be one big bad thing. Okay. So. One of We're my favourite sort of ways of doing demon. this, if you are looking to try and do your encounter scaling, I like using Cobalt Fight Club, which Ooh, is a, a website. It's excellent. You can tell it which content it's allowed to draw from. What was I saying? You could have some some scouting imps. You could have... I, I, this is where I put the Incubus Succubus idea. If that was what was happening in town, they could also be here, guarding the portal, just being in the area of the portal. Um. You get some cool stuff there. If they like successfully charm your people, then they would have an ally in combat, and they could, mm. you get a little PvP element. Well, not quite PvP, but you get yeah. some horrible shit going on. They're, they're fun to fight. Sure. Um, I then stuck on what I didn't do actually was necessarily check if they would come out of the abyss or not. But Chain Devil would be a, a good one for challenge rating eight. That's what yeah. pitches quite well. Oh, then you could have some fun challenge rating twenty pit fiend. Yeah, horrible. I mean. I always feel like again, like back to sort of the devils versus demons thing. Yeah. Like, I always feel like devils are so much. They're more interesting because they are a bit organised and a bit smarter. And you know, they're smart. Whereas yeah. demons are just like jabbering idiots that want death. Um, but I guess you know the, you would get devils in the in the you know all the levels of well sorry in the um, in the levels in the of the abyss because they're fighting the bloody eternal war. So well, yeah. you know, I could easily. I mean, you could even if it's interesting. You could have some overpowered devil come through that's like seen this portal as an escape from the mm. abyss because they've already taken a pasting or half of a pasting somewhere else. So you could have like a weakened, something more powerful than pirate yeah. fight. That would be double cool for any players that know D&D and they see coming through. Um, I've just <laughs> I've started searching for demons rather than devils. Let me just chuck some devils in. Devil. Nah, you can't yeah, you have anything. You could have both. And they're fighting each other and you. Oh, they're already <laughs> fighting. That's cool. I've never done that. I've never had like a three-way combat going. That's fun. I've done it before with like wild animals. But like, right. yeah, picture picture then, you know, they enter this room after the puzzle room and uh, there's this portal. And, they're, you know, as they start to go towards it, something flies, like comes through the portal, but it's not coming forward. It's coming backwards and falls to the floor. It's been pushed it, like, back sta- through it. Yeah. yeah. It stands up, or, like braces for the for what's going to come out of it. 
um, and then something else comes out, and then you know again it gets knocked back and damages the party, and then attacks the party. It realizes they're there, and then that, that's when the combat starts between all three of you. That's cool. One thing I definitely want to add to whatever the fight is in here, this is still Baphomet's twisted space, whether he's aware of it or not. It's his magic. So the terrain yep. is going to have a layer action and the terrain will be shifting on Initiative 20. So I would okay. have columns, fences, piles of carcasses and stuff all moving around as interactable bits of cover. So it might be that at the end of your turn, your rogues are, and I hide behind the pillar and then at Initiative 20, the pillar just goes, whoop, and your rogue's just there, exposed. <laughs> That's cool. This is like a... a um an encounter that I've been thinking of, but not really sure how to get into my game. Um, I had this idea of a, of a rotating platform made mm. of rings. So if you look top down, it's like a dartboard. Yeah. Um, and like the rings are moving in different directions. So yeah, as a layer action, like, you know, everything shifts D12, you know, spaces round. So the rings spin, whatever ring you're on, you go with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's lots of opportunities for uh, reaction attacks between rounds oh yeah uh, but yeah oh, same thing cool. with, with your uh moving bits of stuff in the room if you've got like five yeah. key pieces of furniture in in a you know a five by five grid or you know six by six something like you know not too yeah. big then how how would you decide what moves where or would you as a dm do it intentionally to make it difficult um i wouldn't do it intentionally this is not a controlled area this is chaotic this is <laughs> A, a natural manifestation of Baphomet's bullshit. Cool. So I don't, I don't want it to be used against the players. I will make it largely random, but I would probably just you know, roll a d6 and see which direction it moves in. Sure. Um, and I have like a fixed number of spaces that it might move. And you know, as DM, I might make some thematically interesting choices. I might like block someone in if it looks like that they've put themselves in between three bits of furniture. It's like, okay, well, the fourth one just pops into existence right in front of you. You're now sort of trapped in there. La, 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 la. Little things like that. Very cool. Because because it just it means they've got to use a bit of movement to get out of it or yeah. stuff. So, yeah, I would definitely be fudging those roles. But at least the general mechanism would be initiative 20, roll some dice, see which direction everything moves in. Yeah. Here's, here's a tip then. For, for things like direction... Um, a D4, because yeah, got, you know, say four directions moving. Like I, I, I meant to say eight, the, but yeah, four is ah, right, eight, of. eight diagonal as well. Yeah, and then yeah, just a a D6 for how many spaces it moves. Yeah, easy peasy. Yeah, and that's not so, going to take too long to sort out as well if you've only got like you know a handful of key bits of furniture that are affected by this. Yeah, and again, if you're still using roll twenty or similar, it's easy enough. You bang them on a token layer, make them only movable by the DM. Job done. Mm -hmm. Ooh, you know what would be interesting? Say you've got a like a hanging from the ceiling. You've got like some meat hooks on one side. Mm. If that moves oh. through a creature, um, they have to do a deck save, or they take some piercing damage and potentially get hooked. That's fun. Yeah. So like, if it's a rack that's ten mm -hmm. foot or fifteen foot long, and it moves right to left, it could could catch someone and like yank them across, and they have to do a, a strength check to get themselves off or whatever. Yeah. I'm just thinking, like, and like small stuff, benches or lower mm -hmm. items. You have to make a deck save as it blasts through your area to see if you get knocked prone or not, and oh, loads of little, see, little I, irritations. I love things like this because I feel like too often combat is a case of yeah, the frontline fighters go forward and the backline guys stay at the back. Yeah, like, and then it's just rinse and repeat until everything's dead. I I love thinking about how I can get people to think about their positioning and their moving and like force them in some instances to to do something different yeah um oh this sounds like a really like it's a bit of a um a cement mixer of a fight now yeah you've got two yes a lot going on you know two two creatures with like fuck ton like they, they they're after each other and you mm. you've got the stuff in the room with you that's working against you like this is really yeah. cool if you stand on something you will move with it basically this is kind of actually drawn on my recent play of the outer wilds so again it doesn't spoil anything too much but there's a quantum mm -hmm. element to some bits of the game and that means you okay. as long as you're observing the something it stays where it is but as soon as you look away and look back it's gone and it's gone somewhere else it blasts around and that must have been sitting in my head when i was thinking about some of this because i like the idea of baphomet's bullshit moving things around the room and it's like but then if you don't look at it, then that's when it switches. And it's all all these recent influences must have been playing into into the session right. idea. But 
I yeah. like it. I would like to run this session. Shall we, just for the sake of a flavor, say whatever level demon you choose, mm. it looks like a bull or something, just to just to tie it to to Baphomet and to tie it why to not? these cows. Absolutely. Like it's got massive fucking horns and cloven feet. Yeah, and you could do it with any of them. I mean, I'm still on Cobalt Fight Club here. If you type into the main search box, devil, so we've got side one. You've got stuff down from challenge rating literally zero. All the way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Basically, there's a devil for every challenge rating up to 26, all the way down to like arch devils and stuff. It's probably not going to be that far up. But let's say, let's say it is a... Um, ba, 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 ba. What's a hellfire engine? That's a construct. Let's ignore that. Yeah, it's like a big-ass machine. Yes. Titivilus. That's a cool name. Let's have one of you. Um, and the, the cool thing with Cobalt Fight Club is it will help you balance your encounters in terms of um, difficulty. So you can sit over in the top left, number of players, the average level of those players. So I've got like, okay, let's say we've got five level six players against one Titivillus. It is deadly because, of course, it is. It's chance rating 16. <laughs> but now we're going to chuck in a demon. So I'll search for demons of a similar challenge rating. Let's go down to the 16s. Oh, I fancy having a uh, Nabasu. A Nabasu. They're gross. I mean, all the demons are pretty much all gross. Like They're, they're all pretty, gross. Yeah. And yeah, okay, this one is like super fucking deadly. There's so much experience on the table for your characters, but they're going to enter the fight at half HP. They're going to enter the fight at uh, with a, a a basic tactic of they will they will remove anyone that's actively attacking them, but their prime target will be the other mm -hmm. um, fiend. I guess the only thing with that would be if the party clocks on to the fact these two are fighting each other primarily, they could just stand back and watch and avoid the stuff. They could. Would you allow that, or would you want to try and force them into the combat a bit more? I think hmm, one of them's going to win. True. So if the party can sufficiently... I mean, they could run away. Running away is always an option. Unless the door behind them disappears when they enter the room. Well, that would be a shame, wouldn't it? I mean, it's been happening in the maze. Why wouldn't it happen now? I, do. I, I personally would think that feels cheap. but Okay. Equally, yeah, you could do. But there's still this right. portal in the room as well. So they, they went in to do the portal. That was the goal. They've come in, there's these two great big beer moths slugging out against each other. I probably shouldn't use that mm -hmm. word. That is a thing in D&D, &D, isn't it? But yeah. But these two fiends are battling away. A couple of options then if they don't want to get involved. They either have to wait them out and pick off the, the winner of that fight mm -hmm. and still close the portal. Yep. Maybe if enough combat rounds progress, more stuff comes out the portal. Not high level stuff, but just like backline yeah, annoying some... fighters, little tiny spellcasters or ranged things. I'm thinking like lower than CR one, like stuff like basically minions. But yeah, you know, yeah. if a handful comes out, that's more stuff to have to deal with in this cement mixture of a combat. A bunch of dretches or I was mains the same or thing. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Just a few things spill out, and they will start roaming the area, just generally being chaotic. And so they will find you. They'll sniff you out, and they're going to come and engage you if you take too long to get involved. Mm -hmm. Just so you're not like, yeah, you're not just sitting there being like, let's just sit here, full health, full spell slots, wait until one of them's dead, and then just come out and get the kill steal. Yeah, I uh, use my action to dodge or prepare an action to jump over or duck under the meat hooks if they come this way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's fine, I guess. But yeah, I uh, I love this sound. It, it is so chaotic. Like, there's so much going on in this combat. I love it. It's great. That's that's basically the end of my session idea. That that's what I want to do. I want to have Fantastic. a shifting maze. I want to have a chaotic fight. And I want to theme it all loosely around Baphomet because he is basically a cow, and that's what often goes in abattoirs. <laughs> Job done. Yeah. Nice. I guess one final thought. Hmm. After the after the fight, after they've closed the portal, they've got their cleaver is now a regular plus one dagger, effectively that does slash yeah, damage okay. or something. The party then, what happens? Do they leave the abattoir the way they came? Head back to town? Is there anything that follows on from from having been to the abattoir? Good question. I had expected that if they go in and close the portal, it's still. A grim Scooby-Doo castle on top of a big mountain. Nobody really wants to go there, but at least the mm -hmm. danger has gone. And by closing yeah. the portal and the evidence being in your cursed items now no longer being... Not that you'd know they were cursed, but had you gone away, 
the, the curse is lifted the yeah. the power recedes as, as the portal closes you feel like the the um the overwhelming power of the cleaver starting to drain a little but it still retains some of its magical mm-hmm. fun times so there's there's your in-game explanation as to why it's no longer this op horrible beast that's going to ruin your day you could just walk away like there's no requirement to burn the place to the ground. Like the eruption of Earth is not going to level itself back down, and butterflies yep. are not going to spring out as plants start popping into existence, like the end of a fairy tale. It is not that. It is just that's what's left. That yep. is the the remnants of the battle and the stuff. When you say there's anything hanging on afterwards, what are you talking about? Like when they get back to town and speak again to um, Dwarfy McDwarf Face, who gave them the. Uh, the hmm. point is to go and sort it out. Like, does, is there any do the people in town care at all? Is there anyone that um, you know thanks them or has some stake in this afterwards? Or you know, is <laughs> the dwarf steak. guy even there? Has he? Ha- <laughs> 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 Too many puns. Um, has the is the dwarf even there? Has he mysteriously disappeared now? You know, like what's what what is what is because the party's like, yeah, we've done the job. We will go and talk to the dwarf guy again, see if there's some sort of reward. What plays out there? Yeah, good question. I well probably no. I, I want the dwarf to still be there. Like he had skin in the game, as it were. He had a desire to know what had gone on. He wanted some meat from the meatery, and he wanted his son back, or his servants, or assistants, or whoever it was that he sent up there to basically their deaths. He wants to know yep. what came of them. He's probably gonna make it really clear at the start. I don't know. Basically, I want I want the party to know that the items they received at the start of the session are the loot. They are the prize. He's not going to come back yeah. and say, well, thank you for doing that job. Here is my life savings of gold, because that's not realistic. Like, Sure. If the party wouldn't have to come back and talk to the dwarf, because they've got the loot, they've done the job, coming back and talking to him would be a courtesy. Yes. Okay. So he would thank them and be sad. and Yeah, thanks for the information. Shame about you know, my bloodline, and shame about the lack of cool steak in the world. Anyway, enjoy those items. Yep. I'll I'll sleep easy now, knowing that you know they're at peace or something. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a, a bloody important lesson for your party. Not everything is going to come with a price tag. Like they they sometimes you just do something for the love of the game, don't you? Nice. I like it. Cool. So yeah, I think I am satisfied. Oh no, not satisfied. Sorry. So Town B is the name, but like B B E. What's the name of the dwarf? Because it's not Dwarfy McDwarf Face. No. Let's do a better version of name for the dwarf. So, if he'd sent his son up in there and he wants you to go find him... Oh, yes. Because then he's got a reason to be Scottish. I was thinking more about beef, yeah, steak, yeah. Um, he cool. needs, do, do you want to have a surname? I love a surname. Always. Um, just like Angus Beef Cheeks. <laughs> beef Cheeks, yes. Angus Beef Cheeks, that'll do. <laughs> <laughs> like a funny name's always especially if we're gonna have so much like blood and death and like grossness like Angus the the quest was given to us by Angus Beef Cheeks. Yep. So no, Angus Beef name. Cheeks was um he wasn't just a, a lover of good meat, but he was a like a connoisseur known across the land, like um like a Gordon Ramsay esque level of fame. Okay, and he retired in town B. Well yeah, but he could no longer provide the, the reviews of the stakes in the world or was like I built my fortune selling this across the land and I can't get hold of it anymore. And this is the source. Go and investigate. And he has to send you all up to the hills and you come back empty handed, except for his like cleaver of dreams. Angus beef cheeks. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> we finished there. I think that is that is the end of this session, yeah. Tumbling out of the maze, the wall slides shut behind them, trapping them in a new room. This large, wooden-clad hall is littered with an array of butchery gear. A few stone pillars hold up a tiled roof above. Along one of the walls is a solid oak beam, suspended from which are a set of hanging meat hooks. Towards the far end, they see what looks like... Uh, maybe maybe a guillotine? Various other mechanisms of, of death, a bizarre, twisted sight in an abattoir. In the very centre, the wooden floor gives way to a cobbled stone circle, slick and sticky with the blood of so many slaughtered cattle. 
the tracks between the cobbles shining almost purple as the dim light reflects towards them. The source of this light? A small, pulsing disk of dark, arcane energy floating some five feet above the stone centre. Hmm, delightful, exclaimed Vestel at the sight of the room in front of her. And oh good, there's more moving furniture. As now the benches and pillars and meat hooks are just starting to slide lazily around the room. The hook in Snips' hand starts to vibrate, pulsing in time with the portal's periodic hum. Putting two and two together, she extends her hand, offering up the hook to the Abyssal Gateway. Just before she makes contact, she's knocked back as a great Tetevillus is launched backwards through the portal, crashing down and sending the nearby furniture into a frenzy. The party all die for cover as a twisted horror of a Navasu steps through from beyond this realm, vile twisted horns dripping with blood and entrails. A cloven hoof crushes a giggling dretch who came through just to watch. It raises a terrible axe overhead, when all of a sudden, the pillar hiding Fortescue streaks across the room, leaving him completely visible. The demon pauses momentarily, and brings the axe down in a sweeping motion instead, now towards the exposed swordsman. That is it for both this episode and for this season, the first season of How Would You Run That? A D&D podcast brought to you by myself, Jake Canner, and Lucas Tomlinson. This has been an absolute joy for us to research and record over the last few months, and we're really grateful to you all for sitting through countless hours of us dicking around in the world of D&D. I hope you found some good ideas and some good content, and maybe this has sparked some creative juices of your own for your own games. If that's been the case, please get in touch. We are recording Season 2 now, with a view to trying to get some more content out by the end of 2021 and into the early part of next year. So, watch this space for our new season of the podcast. Season 2 coming soon. Thanks again. Bye, 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 bye.